Colombo, the city suddenly appeared out of the haze, and a bleak picture appeared before our eyes. Everything around us was yellow, the sky, the sea, the houses. A strong monsoon was blowing. Our boat entered the harbour and headed for the floating. There were few warships in the harbour. Our boat was the first submarine to arrive here after the revival of the Eastern Fleet, which grew and grew stronger before our eyes. After last year's crushing Japanese attack, the remnants of the fleet retreated to Kilindini Bay, but now new ships began to arrive, and Colombo Harbour has reopened. Fighting at sea could not yet be called active. There were insufficient resources, and there were not enough aircraft to support a task force in the region. In Colombo Harbour, a semi-submerged cruise ship, hit by the Japanese and remaining upright, was used as a mine depot. A little further away lay a tanker run aground on its side. In the heart of the harbour, the wreck of a wrecked destroyer rested on the bottom. The harbour was in a deplorable state, but no great destruction was visible in the city. That major Japanese air raid on Colombo was a turning point on the western flank of the fighting. The Japanese lost most of their aeroplanes and never came back here again. Our pilots gave them a good lesson. Colombo was an advanced base, because between the islands of Ceylon and Sumatra, there was nothing but endless expanses of water. This huge thousand-mile-wide gap was to be bridged by our flotilla and a few Dutch aeroplanes. The fighting unfolding in Burma made it necessary to endeavour to cut off the supply lines to the Japanese for resources to Rangoon. We looked carefully at the maps and tried to understand what this new war represented. There were very significant differences between this theatre of war and the one we had left two months earlier. The main thing that concerned us was the great distances involved. From Colombo to the island of Penang is 1276 miles, from Rangoon to Malacca about 1000 miles. Since the limit of visibility was only 10 kilometers, it was clear that without proper aerial reconnaissance, enemy ships would go undetected and slip away unless patrolling close to the ports. Thus we outlined a rough plan of our operations. Perhaps the chief differences between this war and the war in Europe were the harsh nature of the enemy and the pristine nature of the territories. There were no picturesque islands like the Greek islands, no Monte Carlo that we had previously admired. The enemy was not in the habit of taking prisoners. We had to adapt to the new, more intense nature of the fighting. If before we could afford to show mercy to the surviving members of the enemy's crews, now we began to treat them more harshly. This was forced upon us by the cruelty of the Japanese. During the day, these calm waters were heated by the hot sun. The nights were clear, but sometimes fierce squalls came, blinding us with flashes of lightning and pouring down heavy rain. There were no shore lights. These heavily forested shores were uninhabited. Jungle, storms, barbarism and brutality. That's what this theatre of war was. We British had to adapt to an environment of which we had a poor understanding. On an early October morning, two submarines approached Penang Island from the north. The full moon was shining and dawn was in no hurry to replace the sweltering night. The sea surface was like a mirror in a moonlit room. It had rained during the night, wetting the watchmen on the bridge. Visibility was poor. In the distance, the dark outline of the island appeared. No lights could be seen. The enemy had taken care of the blackout. We did not know that to the south of us in the Strait of Malacca moved Japanese submarine. She was on her way from Singapore to join the enemy flotilla based at Penang. As we began to approach the island, the Japanese boat approached us. Two miles from the shore, we submerged. Dawn held danger. At that time, the enemy's aerial surveillance planes were taking to the sky, from which they could spot the dark cylinder of our boat on the surface of the water. Also, the greenish glow of the keel jet could give us away. Silently drifting patrol boats could hear the noise of our diesel engines. So we must dive well in advance. There was a frightening uncertainty in these waters. A battle could break out at any moment, and both sides were on guard. Submarines had not operated in this area for a long time. For months there had been complete calm. The Japanese waited tensely without taking any action. They sat motionless in the sweltering jungle and listened to the silence. The sound of footsteps would mean to the Japanese that Allied troops were about to strike. The atmosphere was anxious and nervous. Danger threatened on all sides, so caution had to be exercised. On the submarine, confidently approaching the island from the south, did not show due diligence. The Japanese sailors, soothed by the proximity of the shore, were preparing for the landing and were already anticipating a hot breakfast in the cosy dining room. We were familiar with this peacefulness when the shore is a few miles away and home is in sight. 
that this carelessness had cost those sailors their lives. We travelled north parallel to the shore and waited for sunrise. The image in the eyepiece of the periscope was dim. The rain that had begun to fall was impairing visibility. The water reflected the small dark clouds that came from the north. We had breakfast in our warm, well-lit mess hall. The officer of the watch plotted a course on the chart and looked again through the periscope at the long black island just off to the side from which the sun was to rise. The officer wore a black hood over his head, protecting his eyes from the light of the instruments. His vision quickly adjusted to the blue of the pre-dawn twilight. At 530, the enemy was four miles away. After a while, he approached to a distance of 2,000 yards. By this time, it was dawning, but the sun had not yet risen above the horizon. The black object, whose vague outline the officer of the watch had noticed in the fog, came into better view, and it became clear that it was a submarine, the most desirable of targets. This news spread instantly through our vessel. It might be the same submarine that had sunk the British vessel a few months earlier. The surviving crewmen were dragged out of the water and cut to pieces by the Japanese. Others were tied up and thrown overboard to drown. This was recounted by the miraculously surviving captain of the British ship, who was taken off the lifeboat. Both his hands were cut off. Our commander was not much of a talker. As we rushed after this submarine, we turned left and the target disappeared from sight for ages. We prayed to God she wouldn't disappear altogether. And then the order was given to open fire. The attack from close range was rapid. There was no time to think and calculate. In three minutes the torpedoes were already on their way to the target. In the headphones hydrophone shrill sounds of six engines of our torpedoes drowned out the noise of enemy diesel engines. The explosion sounded at exactly the right time. The thundering roar made the steel hull of our boat shudder. The commander raised the periscope and looked through the eyepiece, but saw nothing. The surface of the sea was clear. The noise of the diesels had stopped. We were not sure, but everything indicated that the submarine had sunk. Three minutes after the explosion, and six minutes after the discovery of the Japanese submarine, we were already sitting in the mess hall finishing our breakfast. At the time of the attack, the commander felt very ill. He had a fever. Half an hour ago, the sun hid behind the mountains of Malaya. We had just surfaced, with drops of water still dripping off the bridge. The hull of the boat glistens, reflecting the last pink tones of the passing day. It's cool up here. I breathe in the cold night air and my chest aches ace from the temperature difference. It feels like ice water in my lungs. The wind and the rain that has been pouring all day have cooled the air. Now the sky and the sea are clear. But the northern horizon is covered with clouds and the moon is not yet visible. Soon the weather may turn bad again. The boat's engines are silent. We drift silently and listen to the night. Before going into deep water, we need to make sure there is no enemy nearby. My palm feels the coolness of the damp line. I look carefully through the binoculars, but I see nothing, nothing at all. Out of the darkness comes a voice. All clear on the port bow, sir. Then a knock. Yes, all clear on the starboard bow. There's five men up here. We allow ourselves to relax a little and point our binoculars at the stars that have appeared. Suddenly someone turns round and says, Do you hear that? We freeze like statues and strain our ears. In the ensuing silence, the faint click of the brass mouthpiece touching the button sounds like a gunshot. The night is very quiet, and all sorts of thoughts come into my head. After a moment I do hear something, a faint humming noise that merges with the sound of the waves lapping against the hull, then reappears. It is a pulsating humming noise coming from the north. We immediately point our binoculars there, but it is too dark to see anything. This noise, waxing and waning, was a bad omen. It could have been made by the high-speed engines of the torpedo boat that was searching for us. The commander turned abruptly. Let's go. They're still a long way off. And we sped across the strait towards Singapore. The sound of our diesel engines drowning out that distant rumble. Now we have to be careful to spot them before they spot us. An hour passes. We must have succeeded in breaking away from the enemy. I close my strained eyes, but someone shouts. I say, son... Yes, there's definitely something out there. The sky overhead is already covered with clouds, but this does not prevent us from seeing the dark silhouette of a moving vessel, in which we immediately recognize a Japanese anti-submarine ship. It passes behind us at high speed and disappears in the darkness. We don't seem to notice it. We make a sharp turn and increase speed. 
A thick fog has descended on the sea and visibility has deteriorated. It was raining. We were heading towards the center of the Strait of Malacca, somewhere Aston, two anti-submarine ships were still searching. How many more of them are out there? Damn those little yellow bastards! A gap appears in the shroud of fog and someone shouts. Empty submarine ship starboard bow, sir. Hmm. Hard to port. Full throttle. Take the dive station. Throws the commander. The boat shudders and lurch while the rudder is turned. The engines howl and snort, changing revs. Dinner will have to be delayed this night. The sailors below sit silently at their posts, waiting for the next order. They don't know what's going on outside. It's different here on the bridge. We see the enemy and we can tell if he's detected us or not. We even know what he is. But only the commander is watching the movements of the anti-submarine ship hunting us. The rest of us are watching with binoculars, each in his own sector. Danger can come from any direction. It is true that from time to time we turn round and glance over our shoulder to see if the boat has broken away from the pursuer or not. Sanding behind me says, We seem to have slipped away. Get back on course. Shorter stroke. We turn round in the dark. Through the haze of fog, a faint starlight shines through. The bright Sirius is reflected on the flat surface of the water. In half an hour the moon will appear and then our boat will be visible from miles away. The visibility will be better for us, though. The full moon shines equally on everyone. By 400 we had travelled 30 miles south and turned left to get closer to the coast and the sea lanes. Ahead, where the moon peeks out from behind the clouds, the sea is illuminated. Aft, it is dark and raining. We wait for the moment when the dim light appearing in the east will make the stars go out. 4.15. 15 miles ahead, there must be a shore. The terrain is flat. From this distance it can't be seen because of the haze. For a moment I have the feeling that all the troubles of the night are over and we can relax. But it, the Japanese know that we are in the area, which is marked on the maps with the letter F, and continue the search. At exactly 4.20 we noticed an anti-submarine ship appearing out of the fog astern. Our boat was just on the moon track and the Japanese were about a thousand yards away. The situation was critical. The commander again ordered full thrust. The chance of escape was minimal. This ship has a speed of 24 knots against our 12, probably carrying torpedoes. 4.25. The long, short silhouette of the ship is clearly visible in the moonlight. It is not yet in pursuit of us. We turn our stern to it and try to get away unnoticed. It fails. She turns round sharply so that her bow is buried in the water and comes out at full speed. We rush towards the shore but it can't last long. If we're not careful, we'll run aground. We try to turn round, but the ship changes course and runs into us. The Japanese are determined. We can imagine their joy. The young commander of the ship must have spent many months unsuccessfully scouring the sea in search of prey and finally found the desired target. He's probably licking his fat lips excitedly right now. 4.30 The enemy is closing in. He obviously sees us and is in no hurry. The commander makes a quick decision and the boat gives a shrill howler. Dive, we hastily jump into the hatch and find ourselves in the semi-darkness of the main station where we are met by sailors. On their faces, a mute question. We start diving. 5 seconds, 10, 15, 40 feet, 60 feet, 90 feet. There's complete silence on the boat. Now the angle of descent is shallower, we're starting to level off. Everyone's watching the depth gauge. I wonder how deep we'll be when the first depth bomb goes off. 45 seconds, 100 feet. Approaching from the left, reports the hydrophone operator who can hear the enemy. One minute, 110 feet. We are almost leveled up when one after another, there are four tremendous explosions. The lights go out for a moment and come back on. Something falls noisily from the subwatch. The boat shudders. A mass of compressed water shakes the hull. The first series of bombs explode not very close, 130 feet. We continue the slow dive in complete, almost unnatural silence. Horizontal rudders can't stop the dive. The commander tries to increase the speed of the dive a little, but it doesn't help. The boat is too heavy. You can't switch on the pumps. The enemy can hear them. It's dangerous to increase speed too much. 150 feet. The time is 4.40. Up there, the Japanese must be watching the sunrise. Their radio transmitter is probably sending encrypted signals with information about our boat. In a few hours, this message will be on the desk of our staff officer in Col At the floating base, 
the cipher officer and the others will learn that one of the boats is stranded. This news they will discuss over breakfast. At 4.45, the boat gently and noiselessly lies on the bottom. The commander switches off both engines, and we are left in yellow silt at a depth of 175 feet. Not very shallow, but not very deep either. It's an anti-submarine ship zigzags above us. Every now and then the Japanese drop a depth bomb, but these explosions only shake the water. The enemy listens to all sounds that might help him determine our position. At 500 hours, he suddenly stops. It's an old trick. We're supposed to think the ship's gone and will surface, but we can't fall for that trick. The Japanese ship is in calm water, waiting for reinforcements. The officers are probably crouched on the bridge now, smoking, talking, and wondering from time to time from their hydrophone operator if he hears anything. They know the boat is somewhere here below them, but that's not enough. To sink us, they must not only locate us, they must hit us with their bombs. It's not as easy as it looks. Meanwhile, we're getting hot. The air is humid and foul. The exhaust fans aren't working. The lollipops we love so much have melted in the jar and turned into a solid mass. The floorboards are wet with dripping sweat. I quietly walk through the compartments and outline the situation to everyone. No one is trying to act like a film character. No one is betting on the time and place of the next depth bomb explosion. Most of the crew are dead tired and can hardly stand the heat. They sit silently by their valves and levers and have pious faith in the commander. In the illuminated torpedo room, the sailors lie on their backs, staring at the curved steel sub. The torpedo men are separated from the others and are a somewhat isolated group. I tell them that there is a small anti-submarine ship up there that has probably already dropped most of its bombs. This news is not encouraging to anyone. There's no point in bullshitting the enlisted and petty officers, and they don't need my encouragement. I say what I think and leave them to their own thoughts. I return to the dimly lit main post. It is necessary to conserve electricity. The commander paces back and forth, crumpling a piece of paper with his hand. This habit is familiar to us and can tell us a lot. His fingers crumple the paper, unfold it, crumple it again. Suddenly the paper ball flies into the darkness. What next? We must try to get off the bottom, says the commander. If we stay here long, our Japanese friend will wait for reinforcements. Prepare to blow the main ballast tanks. Air begins to enter the ballast tank and displace the water. The boat becomes several tonnes lighter, but remains at the same depth. Blow slowly through four. Blow through six. Small back. Stop blowing. Shit. The boat is still in the muddy sludge. We blow more vigorously and finally the boat moves. We can't hear the anti-submarine ship. We have hope that it's gone with the tidal current. Both engines centre forward. Orders the commander. The boat shudders and goes forward. The arrows of the depth gauge shake. We surface slowly, but we make a lot of noise. At that moment, the Japanese hear us. They switch on the engines and at full speed come to us. The time is 5.45. It's been over an hour. 170 feet. We're travelling at slow speed. We hear the whistle of an anti-submarine ship passing on the surface. The seconds drag on for an inordinate amount of time. Does he have any bombs left or not? It seems like an eternity passes before we get an answer to this question. The bombs begin to explode again. The explosions come one after another in rapid succession. There is a great rumble and the boat shudders as if the hull has been hit with a huge hammer. The lights flicker and we are in total darkness for a while. Things take a serious turn. The boat is angling in an unknown direction. The compass rings, followed by a shrill alarm. The vertical and horizontal rudders cease to obey the helmsmen who are desperately trying to level the boat. All depth gauges fail. Some say 400 feet deep. Others claim 20. From somewhere in the tangle of telemetry tubes comes a whistling sound. It's precious compressed air rushing inside the boat. That's the cause of the system failure. Stop that bloody whistling. Stumbling around in the dark, we try to troubleshoot and fix the leak, but the whistling continues. The depth gauge in the engine room seems to be working. The information from there, sailors in a chain transmitted to us at the main post. After a while, the emergency lights are switched on, and finally it turns out that it is possible to raise the periscope. Meanwhile, the boat is still at an acute angle to the horizon, and the planking is very slippery. The mechanics silently wander round the boat with torches and spanners. Raise the periscope, the commander orders. He looks through the eyepiece and says sharply, 
We're on the surface. Guns ready for action. Blow out the main ballast. Enemy bearing 45 degrees port. Let's surface. We run to the ammunition cellar. Open it. And in a minute the cosy little wardroom is in a complete shambles. The hatch is open, we get out of the boat and rush to the gun. The sunlight is blinding for a moment, but we quickly spot an anti-submarine ship off to the left on the bow. We can hear its machine gun bursts. A moment later, the flame of a shot bursts from the barrel of the Japanese vessel's gun. The shell flies over our heads and falls into the sea far behind us, causing us no harm. Nudge shooting. We quickly load the cannon with four-inch shells and open fire. The two vessels are now running parallel courses, firing all kinds of guns at each other. The steering of our boat is still inoperative. We have to make do with the engines. After the darkness and stuffiness, it is nice to be out in the sunshine and breathe in the fresh air. Through binoculars, I can see the Japanese gun crew scurrying around the deck. Our shells are falling close to the ship. I try to correct the firing, but the gunners are doing a good job as it is. Our shells explode closer and closer to the Japanese ship. The enemy cannon goes silent. It seems that a shrapnel caught someone from the gun crew. The Japanese gunners disappear in one of the hatches. The ship turns round and starts to leave. Above 200. Correction zero. The command sounds. The ship is moving fast, but no faster than our shells, one of which hits its bow. A black mushroom of smoke rises into the air. The enemy is on fire. This hit forces them to resume the fight. The anti-submarine ship turns round and goes back. Its gun crew is back at the cannon. We quickly change our aim and our shell hits the bridge where the young, arrogant officers are standing. From that moment, the battle is won for us. The enemy fire becomes indiscriminate. The ship begins to trot helplessly. Our artillerymen are performing flawlessly. Another shell hits the very center of the ship. Another destroys its cannon. The third explodes in the engine room. The ship stops. All that remains is to finish it off. The pilot of a Japanese seaplane with a green fuselage and bright red floats, which has been circling above us for three minutes, does not seem to understand what is really going on here. It's the calm sea and bright sun must have made him peaceful, and he has no idea that there is a battle going on below. He probably thinks there's a drill going on. The shiny grey glaze of the ship on the blue water, next to it the green hull of our boat, over which the birds soar calmly. On such a day, one does not want to remember the war. The aircraft makes a few more circles over the battle area before the pilot correctly assesses the situation and heads towards us. But three seconds later we disappear underwater, leaving only the ripples of the propellers on the surface. Two bombs fall in the distance from us, but by this time the boat is already 60 feet below the surface and we proceed to clean up. Dissatisfied that we have been prevented from sinking the anti-submarine ship, we are in no hurry to leave but go up to periscope depth to see what is going on up there. The ship stands where it stood, the seaplane circling low over the water. From the shore, we can see the masts of two armed trawlers approaching. We loaded on time. The trawlers are sure that our boat has sunk. The pilot of the seaplane is also sure of it. For the rest of the day, the trawlers survey the area, throwing depth bombs and trawling the bottom. We watch them from the west with a smile and slowly move out into deeper water. We surface to get out of the area faster, but two minutes later another seaplane appears and we have to dive again. Ten minutes later we again attempt to surface and are successful. We quickly head off to the north and do not dive until ten miles later. By this time the boat is again obedient to all our commands. The repairs are carried out quickly and methodically. We're tiredly clearing the wardroom floor of rubbish, shell caps and ammunition magazines. By the time of evening tea the cleaning is finished and the room is restored to its former appearance. Sardines are served for tea. Things are getting better. As a few days passed, we were travelling north towards the Burmese town of Tavoy past the Murguay archipelago. Once the Strait of Maleka was behind us, the weather improved. One day we spotted in the distance a huge merchant ship heading for Rangoon, carrying a whole forest of masts and jibs of cargo cranes. Harry, who spotted it, reported seeing the Barrow Inferno shipyard on the horizon. Unfortunately, it passed beyond the reach of the fire. At night, the sweet sickly odour of the jungle wafted from the shore. The lights of dwellings occasionally appeared, but most of the time the landscape remained deserted. There were many junks carrying cargo close to the shore. For the time being, we did not touch them and watched the colourful sails with interest. The junks were doing legitimate business. 
Later, the Japanese Maritime Administration took the owners of the boats into circulation, forcing them to deliver food and equipment for the Japanese army. Thousands of junks were employed for this purpose, hundreds of which were sunk by our flotilla. The crews of the junks were taken off the ship by our sailors and put ashore somewhere. At this time there was fierce fighting in the north. In the Pacific, the Americans were capturing island after island to get closer to the Philippines and the coast of China. For them, the Far East was the same as the Mediterranean was for us not so long ago. In Burma, the British Army waged a war of a similar nature and importance to that waged by the Allies in North Africa. For the first time, a European army was beating the Japanese on land. In the forests and jungles, British and Dominion troops fought hand in hand with Chinese and Indians. It was an international army. In a way, we were guerrillas, for we operated far behind the enemy's defences in his very lair. Submarines participated in open battles and acted stealthily, sneaking up to the enemy, striking and hiding under the cover of night or in the depths of the sea. Although we too were caught in critical situations, our efforts could not be compared to the harsh routine of British or Australian soldiers fighting in the jungle who did not return to Colombo for holidays. They didn't have a cosy canteen, good food and an evening glass of beer. A thousand miles from their nearest base, the submariners had domestic amenities and led quite normal lives. Few of us had been in the shoes of those soldiers. When we finished our patrol, we headed back. We passed the deserted Nicobar Islands where there was nothing to look at. On the surface, the officer of the watch, leaning on the charred wood of the bridge, surveyed the horizon. Sometimes a tree floating in the distance could be mistaken for a large merchant ship. Such mirages caused false alarms more than once. After passing the islands, we set a course for Colombo and cruised at cruising speed along the smooth, mirror-like surface of the Indian Ocean. But even now we could not relax. After a day of transition in 250 miles from the Nicobar Islands observers, noticed an aircraft approaching from behind. It was a Japanese Navy long-range reconnaissance bomber. We dived immediately and the bombs exploded without causing any damage to the boat. An hour later we are floating on the surface again, but the observers are alert. Colombo is still three days away. Three days of continuous sailing westwards to where the sun sets. Three days of zigzagging through this endless blue. But time flies very fast and we have enough patience. Chapter 20 Trincomalee Harbour is about midway along the east coast of the island of Ceylon. This very picturesque, but deserted place was nicknamed Scaper. The harbour was well protected from the monsoons, and as too many merchant ships were now calling at Colombo, the eastern fleet began to move to Trincomalee. The harbour itself was only an anchorage three miles wide. Ships could not approach the tiny moorings by the palm tree-lined shore. Nearby, a local village stood among the trees and a little further north was the new British Navy base. To the west of it were the small Catalina airfield and the RAF Sunderlands airfield, camouflaged so that they could not be seen. Beyond that there were long white beaches, deep caves, impenetrable jungle, and everlasting palm trees leaning over the water. Many of us moved here happily, away from the pesky bosses and fussy Colombo. Here we sailed, swam, fished, and had parties in tiny bungalows built by engineering officers from Cochin. Soon the Navy women's auxiliary arrived and were housed in a comfortable stone house next to the Navy base. For a few months, the sailors of the submarine flotilla lived here quite comfortably. But later, when the whole fleet arrived, it became too crowded and the charm of the place faded somewhat. Still, Trinco, as we called the base, was our home and we... In their spare time, the boat crew would tear off and escape to the hills to enjoy the scenery and get some fresh air. The sailors would linger for long periods of time with the planters who were masters of their craft. We were allowed to take leave at Colombo, but few had the desire to do so, as there was little pleasure in travelling by train. The roads were bad, and if we managed to catch a lorry, the long, tedious journey spoilt the whole holiday. So we tried not to go anywhere and made up our own entertainment. One afternoon in Trincomalee, we took a sailing dinghy out to sea. The water in the harbour was sparkling from the bright rays of the sun, and it was a pleasure to sail. In the dinghy, as usual, was our hunting kick. A 12-gauge rifle, a machine gun, a pistol, and several small underwater charges. These charges weighed one pound and a quarter, and we used them to hunt turtles and catch fish. Waiting for us at one of the piers were three girls from the Navy Women's Auxiliary. After they had safely climbed into the dinghy, we said, the wind was blowing from the stern, with spray flying off the bow. 
In one of the small bays we pulled the dinghy up to the shore, bathed and proceeded to an evening tea party consisting of gin, lime juice and sardine sandwiches. At the entrance to the bay, our friend Peter was waiting for us on the jetty. The palm leaf roof of his bungalow was orange in the sunset light. By the time we docked the dinghy and went ashore, it was beginning to get dark. Night was approaching, but the air was still warm. It was always warm in those parts. Clothes are only needed to protect us from mosquitoes. Peter had a look of contentment on his face. He did a pretty good job of fishing with the blasting charges. Seven large mullet and fifteen yellowtail are lying on the table in his small kitchen, glistening with scales. We unload bottles from the bag, switch on the gramophone, take out the dice. Outside the window in the water at the very end of the jetty, we can see the phosphorus glowing trail of some night swimmer. When the bungalow oil lamps shine dimly, we hear the clinking of glasses. From far away comes the rhythmic drumming. It is a party of locals who have come here from the Malabar coast. Low over the harbour you can see the falling lights of an aircraft returning from a patrol. In the distance, the signal lamp of an unseen ship patrolling in the bay at the harbour entrance flashes. The war continues. Meanwhile, we sip whiskey, which hottens our blood. Someone starts a slow dance on the wooden terrace. The loud laughter of dice players can be heard. A girl in a swimming costume still glowing with phosphorescent light runs past the bungalow. It's time to leave. Peter has volunteered to give us a lift in his big lorry. We sit in the back, bouncing on the bumps and humming something. Nights like that are memorable. Later, when we will be asked if we liked serving on a submarine, we will say that we did, but we will not mean the time we were at sea, but the happy days we spent ashore in Algiers. Beirut, Port said, Aden and Trincomalee, we will fondly remember the islands of the Aegean, the sun-drenched coast of France, and the snow-capped peaks of Sumatra. Shall less often will we mentally revisit those rare moments when we fought the enemy. These battles faded and faded from memory like the keel of a ship. They left no deep traces in our memories. Life was full of sharp contrasts. A few days ago we were patrolling in the dark waters of the Strait of Malacca near jungle-covered islands, and today we were sunbathing with friends on a white sandy beach or dancing under the stars in the open air of our mess hall. Such were the contrasts, light and shadow. After a while, an atmosphere of mystery thickened around us, which was felt in everything. The commander conferred for long periods of time in private with gloomy-looking military men. Suspicious packages were brought to the boat. Apparently, some kind of joint operation was being prepared, and remembering the sad experience with the guys from BP and Bo, we were not particularly happy about it. Every day we were visited by army officers of higher and higher rank, their insignia shining more and more, the shades of Berets becoming brighter and brighter. Clearly something very serious was being plotted. Despite the fact that almost everyone on the floating base knew about the forthcoming secret operation, when the military decided to conduct a shore landing exercise, we sailed, observing conspiracy, and stood on a barrel in a remote corner of the harbour. The landing party consisted of five officers, two army signalmen, and six Indians. The work was not easy. The cargo they were going to take with them weighed 8,000 pounds. We practiced and argued and spent hours practicing the method of unloading the cargo on the enemy's shore. The work was tedious but interesting, and in the end all the difficulties were left behind us. It was a beautiful evening when our boat left the harbour with passengers and cargo. We were followed to the breakwater by several yachts with friends who saw us off. The floating base signalled to wish us good luck. The ship guarding the breakwater saluted dashingly. When the boat turned to the east, the breeze from the sea blew, and at once the light sadness of parting with friends disappeared. There was a joyous cheerfulness in the wardroom. The sun was setting astern. On the pink background of the sky outlines of ships coming from the south of the convoy, which were carrying goods from England. Soon they disappeared from sight, and we continued on through the vast expanse of water separating us from the enemy. It was the 15th of December, with ten days to Christmas. At dawn on the 20th of December we loaded, approached the jungle-covered shore, and waited for sunrise. Our passengers had long since risen and were preparing to disembark, oiling and cleaning their rifles, pistols and knives. In the torpedo room sailors were assembling dinghies for them. These collapsible dinghies were a modernised version of the collapsible peacetime canoe. It was fairly simple to assemble. You pressed down hard on the bottom to create the bow and stern, and then stapled the structure together. I was afraid that the material would not withstand the stress, but everything went smoothly. 
the wood and sailcloth stood the test. The rubber boats were handled by Monty, our mechanic, who had missed the previous patrol due to an attack of dysentery. He was assisted by Harry, who wanted to rehabilitate himself after the debacle of the Aegean landing. I was to stand on the bridge and be in charge of liaising with the shore and making sure the boat didn't run into rocks. The sea time was to be 90 minutes after sunset. We remembered Hollywood films and synchronised our watches. It was not necessary to blacken the faces with vax. The faces of the Indians were dark enough as it was, and as for the others, as the Major explained to us, the sharp-eyed Japanese would still notice the white palms of the British, as had happened more than once in the jungles of Burma. With the help of photographs taken by RAF pilots, we found a gentle bank between the rocks and chose landmarks that would be useful at night. Just off the sandy shore rose the slope of a forested hill. The terrain was completely unexplored, and therefore the lack of fresh water and the aggressiveness of the native tribes worried the major much more than a possible clash with the Japanese. The natives there hunted for scalps, and they did not care whether the trophy was white or yellow. Remembering the poisoned arrows, our passengers began to set the sights of their long-barreled pistols. Fortunately, the weather was calm. Light waves were calmly lapping on the inshore reefs. About six miles to the north was a small village where a Japanese patrol might have been stationed. It later transpired, however, that units of the Indian National Army, Chandra Bose, were stationed in the area. Fighting in the jungle was not its strong point. That night we organised a dinner party. A glass of beer was poured for everyone and the commander toasted to the success of our guests, who were eager to disembark and had the look of confident men. On the way from Trincomalee, our boat was frequently bombed, and the Major declared that he preferred to be in the jungle among ticks and mosquitoes. He and his subordinates thought us a little crazy for volunteering to spend so much time in that cramped steel tube. We again scrutinised the outlined plan of action. The commander was responsible for the safety of the submarine and was in charge of the entire operation. The Major was somewhat sceptical about our role in this operation until we convinced him that the Japanese could easily put an end to our naval careers if they captured any of his crew. At that time we did not yet know the situation ashore. We agreed that a yellow flag displayed at a certain place at a certain time meant that everything was clear and there was no danger. Having discussed all possible nuances, the participants of the operation lay down to sleep for an hour. That night, the sun went down around 19.0. At 20.30, we surfaced five miles from the shore, opened the bow hatch and pulled out two assembled dinghies. At the same time, Monty and his assistants got the rubber dinghies through the gun turret and brought out the air hose. A wooden planking specially made for the occasion was used as a slipway, which was fixed to the hull of the boat. While the remaining dinghies were still being assembled, the first batch of cargo was already being lifted through the hatch and transferred into the darkness. Everything was going smoothly. Monty soon reported that several rubber boats were inflated and ready to be loaded. They were immediately loaded and nailed down. At this time we found on the bridge that we could not find our chosen landing place. During the day the boat had drifted to the north, where our carefully prepared maps proved useless. It was not until midnight that we finally found a gap in the reefs and stopped 300 yards from shore. We had to act quickly. At dawn a patrol could spot us and the operation would have to be abandoned. At 0 0.30, the first two dinghies were already in the water with the crew, and our sailors began to carefully lower the loaded inflatable boats into the water. They were tied up and towed to shore on the dinghies. One man from each dinghy remained on shore to haul the load into the jungle. The others returned for the next batch of cargo. The work was gruelling, but we got the job done. When dawn broke, the military had hauled about 4,000 pounds of cargo ashore. The Major, who was on the last dinghy, bade us a cheerful farewell and disappeared into the darkness. We looked after him and tried to imagine what it would be like for the Major and the others in the jungle. They would hardly be able to sleep. We'd have to find water and post sentries. The next day our boat headed for the shore just after sunset. Having noticed a yellow flag in the agreed place, we began to look for a gap in the reefs, and again it took us about two hours. About 10 p.m., a dinghy appeared from which the Major waved to us. He was angry at our lateness and said what he thought of us. Our commander, in turn, made a valid complaint against him, and a little altercation ensued between them, which was quickly brought to an end as work began. Once more, as on the previous night, the dinghies were inflated, loaded, launched, and take all was going well except for one small incident.
One of the dinghies capsized when an Indian man standing in it was handed a heavy bag of silver. Fortunately, he managed to be pulled out with the bag. Eventually, the Major calmed down and reported that they had found an excellent campsite in the woods, not far from which, on top of a cliff, there was a spring. No Japanese were seen, but they noticed tracks of natives and a few small wild boars in the forest. The place was generally deserted. That night we finished unloading and left the area in the pre-dawn twilight. The day of 21 December was clear and calm. Before our boat could be loaded, a report came from Colombo that a vessel had been sighted off the west coast of Sumatra from an aeroplane heading north. We were advised to move towards Sabang after the landing operation was completed. The enemy naval base of Sabang was located on Pulo Wi Island, off the northwestern tip of Sumatra, in a well-protected inner harbour that was part of a large bay. British naval aviation had already demonstrated its growing strength when aircraft lifted from an aircraft carrier launched a surprise strike on this base. This was followed by a series of strikes that shocked the enemy. There is a long, narrow channel to the west of Pulo V Island by which the coast of Sumatra can be approached. Having studied the map, we decided to take up a position near the northern end of this canal. 25 December 1943. Christmas Day, early grey morning, directly above us loomed the gloomy high mountains. Our boat rocked on the waves between the rocks. When it dawned a little, we could make out trees in the distance and a structure resembling a collapsible Nissan barracks. Soon afterwards the boat was loaded, and in the midst of the Christmas breakfast the signal was sounded, action alert. A large vessel appeared out of the haze of fog and approached the harbour. Suddenly it passed through the outer channel. We ran at full speed into the bay and rushed to meet it. Already in the inner harbour, we found out that the ship was escorted by a destroyer. Without wasting time, we fired six torpedoes at them from close range and waited for the results. The ship turned round and quickly began to move away, while the destroyer came at us and threw a huge depth bomb which exploded where we had been a few minutes before. Then silence reigned. At noon, we held a Christmas Eve service. At the main post, the sailors stood round and sang Christmas carols. Above us, a destroyer was running back and forth watched by the officer on duty. Smoke was billowing from its chimney. He kept looking for us, even when we were already several miles away. I remember wondering that day if the Japanese knew it was Christmas. The sailors kept singing hymns, and I remembered the house and the little church where I listened to these tunes played on a small organ. We spent Christmas 1942 near Cape Nordcap, Christmas 1943 near Sabang. I wonder where we will celebrate Christmas 1944? since the military equipment took up all the available space. There were no spare torpedoes. We decided to end the patrol. The boat had been in good service for 14 months now, and in the spring, if nothing happened, she was due to return to England for reef. In the meantime, we returned to Trinco, but a few days later headed for Colombo for docking. Soon after a brief refit, we sailed into the Strait of Sound and travelled all along the west coast of Sumatra Island. Most of the time we were on the surface, skirting the small islands we encountered along the way. The mountains of Sumatra loomed in the distance against a clear sky, some of them visible from a hundred miles away. In the neighbourhood of the town of Sibolga we sank a tugboat and two oil barges. The next night we found a drifting barge, from the stern of which came singing in one of the local dialects. This, too, had to be sunk. We did not wage war on the Malays and Javanese, but only sank their ships if they helped the Japanese. The Japanese knew our boat was in the Padang area, but did not try to attack. The flotilla was getting stronger. Our submarines increasingly disturbed the Japanese in the Gulf of Malacca and elsewhere. Ek aircraft were striking oil bases in Palembang. In Burma, British forces were on a determined offensive. Perhaps for the first time, the Japanese began to look around for depleted reserves. They knew full well that they would not get any more help from Japan. For the first time, fear gripped them. They realized that retribution was inevitable. Every day the noose tightened tighter around their yellow necks. Our life at the base in Trincomalee was colored by romance. The place itself is extremely picturesque. Its charm could not escape even the gaze of the duty officer, finishing his last cigarette on the bridge of a submarine. From the floating base came the sounds of beautiful music. The lights of bungalows glowed cheerfully, and the dark outlines of warships and aircraft carriers loomed in the distance. When we had a free evening, we took a gramophone and a bottle of whiskey to the bunks of our floating hotel, and a concert by request began. Melodies of Sibelius, Gershwin, Bach, 
Strauss's, Debussy floated in the air. The nights were warm. Listening to music and looking at the stars, we fell asleep. Early in the morning, we jumped up and ran to the beach for a swim. There were often dances in the dining room with a palm leaf roof. We danced in our white uniforms and our charming partners from the Navy Women's Auxiliary in their evening gowns. They moved with a grace that would be the envy of any capital city in the world. When the musicians finished playing, the fun didn't stop. My partners and I threw off our shoes and raced down the beach, past the boats of the locals. The girls' long plumes dragged along the white sand. We realized that we were fortunate to serve in a paradise. Food was plentiful, plenty of cheap cigarettes and wines. The harbor was well guarded and inaccessible to the enemy. Our sailors were not deterred by the lack of night lighting and organized entertainment. They climbed the hills, chatted with the locals and came back cheerful, with enlightened looks and a desire to sail and swim, have picnics and dances, generally enjoy life. We overestimated our part in that war a little. I guess such exaggeration of our importance is inherent in any military unit acting on its own, but sometimes I thought the submariners in Trincomalee were overly arrogant. Of course, we socialized and sometimes even spent time together with other branches of the military, but in general, we kept to ourselves. Of the entire base contingent in those days, in fact, we were the only ones who periodically said goodbye to Trincomalee and disappeared for three or four weeks. We couldn't help but be pleased that information about our achievements was often included in the official reports. As I have already remarked, naval warfare was connected with land operations, and we had no reason to think that we were fighting our own war. On the other hand, the British press persistently ignored events in Burma. This hurt the feelings of the combatants. They did not deserve such indifference. Of course, by and large, a soldier does not care whether he is in the newspapers or not, but the knowledge that you are involved in a second-rate war in which no one has any interest was demoralizing. Eventually, the soldiers of the Forgotten Army began to send letters home full of indignation. Then all the newspapers remembered the war in Burma. Numerous articles quoting from the soldiers' letters appeared, although there were still almost no publications concerning the actual fighting. The British public was not interested in the Burmese events, but in the scandal surrounding them. Submariners in this respect were more fortunate. Our modest successes invariably featured in news agency reports and gave us a romantic halo when we returned to harbour with the Jolly Roger fluttering in the wind. Ashore, we were forgiven for many transgressions. At sea, fighting destroyers, sailors remembered that ahead of them awaited a two-week rest in the harbour, plus ten days leave after each combat patrol. Submariners were provided with extra meals and fruit juices. Another advantage was that submarines had to return to England every 18 months at most for refitting, while battleships and cruisers remained in service for two or three years at a time. Meanwhile, the war was gathering momentum. An invasion of the mainland was being prepared in Europe. Admiral Mountbatten patiently awaited reinforcements. The 24 bombers began bombing Singapore, Penang and Rangoon. Long-range fighters destroyed well-camouflaged coastal ships off the Andaman Islands that were carrying food and ammunition for the Japanese army. The fleet of aircraft carriers was becoming more and more impressive. The Navy's fleet of aircraft was augmented by a new Corsair fighter. One British submarine flotilla left Trincomalee for Australia to interfere with shipping in the Java Sea. Headquarters in Kandy directed the Allied forces in enemy territory. Gradually, the Japanese were surrendering their position in the region. Intelligence was active, except that there were few prisoners. The army picked up wounded Japanese in Burma, submariners took the Javanese and Malays from junks and brought to the headquarters for interrogation, but still not enough information. At the beginning of March, we again went to sea, where the air was fresh and cool. The Andaman Islands cannot be called a resort. Even in times of peace, ships seldom entered the natural harbor of Port Blair. In this town was an Indian penal colony guarded by a Japanese garrison. Perhaps there was no other amusement here except hunting. The Japanese freed the prisoners and made them bend their backs for a paltry ration. Some of the Indians joined Chandra Bose's army. The rest labored in the Japanese camps. From the sea, Port Blair seemed deserted. The harbor was deep with narrow bays far inland disappearing among the green hills. The small Ross Island where most of the administrative buildings were located obscured much of the city. The flag of Japan was flying on the governor's house. Every morning smoke rose into the air over the inner anchorage. We watched and waited, but nothing happened. Fighter planes and bombers took off regularly from the airfield just outside the city, but we were not much concerned. 
Day after day we passed along the minefield at the entrance to the harbour, and at night we went out to the open sea, surfaced, and charged the batteries. All this was beginning to bore us.